Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar hosted by the Hansel Society on Devolved but Denied Regulations and Consent Beyond Westminster. I'm Ruth Fox, I'm the director of the Hansel Society. Um, the essence of our discussion today is about the role of the devolved legislatures in the development and approval of statutory instruments uh, made at the UK level. Not regulations made by the Scottish, Welsh or Northern Ireland executives, but regulations made in Whitehall by UK ministers, which concern issues that fall into areas of devolved policy competence. Now, we're holding this discussion because the Hansel Society is currently engaged in a year-long review of delegated legislation and the parliamentary scrutiny of it at Westminster, supported by a grant from the Legal Education Foundation. So we wanted to have this discussion for a couple of reasons. Firstly, to air the issues, to get different perspectives on this question from each of the devolved nations, but also to use it as a learning exercise for ourselves and others who share the concern that this issue is not particularly well understood, especially in Westminster and Whitehall circles. So I'm delighted that uh, judging by the attendee list, there are quite a lot of people from uh, government departments in Whitehall, various civil servants across a number of departments joining us today. When we talk about regulations, we're talking about regulations and consent at two levels um, that we're particularly focused on. The powers delegated to ministers in primary legislation to make the regulations and the procedures for the scrutiny of the exercise of those powers. And in terms of the powers in bills since 2018, um, there have been some real issues in terms of um, devolved consent to primary legislation at Westminster, particularly arising out of uh, obviously the Brexit process and the perception that the, the mechanism for consent, the Sewell Convention, has broken down. Of course, it's not entirely about Brexit. Uh, there are also political tensions because none of the devolved governments share the political perspective of the UK government. We've now got four governments led by four different political parties with different concerns and interests. Um, but the situation raises a number of critical questions, such as the circumstances in which it's appropriate or necessary for the UK government to legislate by statutory instrument um, and the consequences that, that flow from this. Now, the Sewell Convention has never applied to delegated legislation or, or secondary legislation, or if you're a lawyer, to subordinate legislation, as it's known, in effect, to, to regulations. At the time of the devolved settlement, was when that was established in the late 90s, powers for UK ministers to make delegated legislation in devolved areas transferred to ministers in the devolved governments, with the exception of powers to make delegated legislation to implement EU obligations. Um, but after Brexit, there's now a concern that UK ministers are encroaching on areas of devolved competence previously handled at the EU level, and also legislating to take powers in areas of devolved competence that were never a matter for, for the EU. And in the context of, of today and what's coming at Westminster in the, the coming weeks, of course, it's, it's timely in that the UK government has just published the retained EU law revocation and reform bill, and that's going to bring to the fore, I think, some of these issues that we're going to be discussing today. Now, uh, the, the issues are a bit technical, a bit complex. We will try and uh, ensure that it's all as, as clear as possible. The issues go to the heart, I think, of, of questions about the future of devolution in the union, uh, about intergovernmental cooperation and interparliamentary relations, about resourcing of scrutiny, of transparency, accountability, and whether there's a, there's a democratic deficit. So that's the context um, for our discussion. Um, just a few housekeeping matters before I introduce our speakers. Um, on uh, Zoom, we're not using the chat function. If you've got a question to ask, put it through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you are accessing this through, not through, through Zoom, um, through uh, directly through the internet, this may, this function may be disabled. So I'm afraid that's just a, a limitation of the system. Um, in the Q&A, um, put any questions that occur to you through the course of the discussion and you can upvote those questions and the most popular ones will rise to the top of the pile. Um, and I'll do my best to ensure that we get through as many of them in the time that we've got available. We're going to try and finish at 2.20 because I know some of our members of the panel have got to go away and chair other committees and, and participate in, in various uh, political meetings. So we're aiming to finish at 2.20. 
Um, and uh, we'll also be tweeting this event using the hashtag devolved but denied. So do join in and, and tweet your thoughts. So with that, it's a great pleasure to introduce our panel. Um, we're particularly benefiting today from the fact that two of our panelists have um, served as elected representatives, both at Westminster and in their devolved legislatures. Um, not at the same time, I should say. Um, so uh, first up uh, will be Hugh Ranker davis who's a member of the Senate for Ogmore since 2016. Um, and he was formerly a member of parliament at Westminster also for Ogmore uh, from 2002 to, to 2016. And particularly pertinent to today's discussion, he chairs the Senate's Legislation, Justice and Constitution Committee, which has a number of roles, but particularly uh, does the technical scrutiny of Welsh secondary legislation um, and has a role in relation to UK statutory instruments that, uh, that involve, engage devolved competence. Our second speaker will be Michael Clancy, who's director of law, the Director of Law Reform at the Law Society of Scotland, and particularly grateful to Michael stepping in at very late notice because uh, the eagle-eyed among you will notice that uh, the member of the Scottish Parliament that was due to speak, unfortunately, um, for very good reasons, was unable to do so. So uh, he pulled out um, and uh, Michael very kindly stepped in. He's a member of the International Bar Association, an expert in constitutional matters, particularly commenting on the sort of Scottish constitutional landscape and, and Brexit and uh, regularly gives evidence to, uh, to parliamentary committees about these issues. And then our third speaker will be Dr. Stephen Farry, who's a member of parliament. He's deputy leader of the Alliance Party in Northern Ireland since 2016 and MP for North Down since 2019 at Westminster. But he's also formerly been member of the Northern Ireland Assembly from 2007, also for the North Down constituency. And he served as a, as a government in the North, a minister in the Northern Ireland uh, executive. So we've got a broad, range of experience and expertise. I'm going to ask the speakers to speak for sort of seven, eight minutes on their perspectives on this issue, and then uh, we'll throw it open to the Q&A. So with that, I'm going to invite uh, Hugh to kick us off. Thanks very much, Ruth. Delighted to be here with you in my role on the Senate's Legislation, Justice and Constitution Committee, and also to join Michael and Stephen as well, and what a great topic to get your teeth into under the title of Devolved But Denied. Uh, just to say a couple of introductory remarks about my uh, strange committee there, which covers uh, an inordinate amount of areas of policy and legislation. So subordinate legislation uh, made or to be made by Welsh ministers, uh, Welsh bills on constitutional matters, delegated powers, consolidation bills, as we're doing at the moment, actually. Legislative consent memoranda on UK government bills, uh, which are legislated in devolved areas. Constitutional policy, intergovernmental relations, oversight of common frameworks, UK EU governance, non-trade international agreements, and not forgetting the other, the third part of our title, the very small matter of justice policy. So that's what we do with the members on our committee. I can see probably people on this are raising an eyebrow already saying, how do you do all that with uh, four members and 60 Senate members, and it's a good question. The, the aspect I've omitted to mention so far is that of statutory instruments made by the UK government in devolved areas, which is the focus of this webinar. So let me just outline some of the processes we've got in place in the Senate for scrutiny of these instruments, and then look at some of the challenges we face over the next few minutes. So first of all, there are three ways in which we conduct our scrutiny. They're all interrelated, and actually one, any one statutory instrument could be subject to more than one approach, but I'll take each one in turn. First of all, under the Standing Order 30A, so soon after we took on primary lawmaking in the Senate, Standing Order 30A was introduced for the scrutiny of subordinate legislation made by UK ministers that amends primary legislation in the competence of the Senate. So with this legislation notified to the Senate by means of a Welsh government statutory instrument consent memorandum should be subject to the Senate's consent. Then we have standing order 30C. Uh, now the audience listening to this will know that following the UK's exit from the EU, regulations made under the European Union Withdrawal Act of 2018 
were a vehicle to correct deficiencies in the statute book. So in Wales, there were two ways of doing this. Firstly, Welsh ministers. So Welsh ministers, regulations were subject to scrutiny like any other Welsh government statutory instruments with the committee reporting to the Senate on any relevant technical or merits points. But secondly, of course, by UK ministers acting alone in devolved areas. However, and you mentioned it, Ruth, under the terms of the Emerging Intergovernmental Agreement between the UK and Welsh ministers, they could only do so and continue to do so with the consent of the Welsh ministers. Such regulations made by UK ministers are laid before the UK Parliament only. And that's important to note. So Standing Order 30C sets out a process to enable scrutiny requiring that for regulations made or to be made by UK ministers under that 2018 Act, the Welsh Government must, must lay a statement notifying the Senate of the regulations in question and including certain specified information. So during the fifth Senate, which was the last one before this, and I should say that each Senate period of time following an election is denoted numerically, we're in the sixth now. So running up to May 2021 and fifth Senate, our predecessor committee considered 218, 218 such instruments, such statements, sorry, which amounts to a significant volume of statutory instruments being made by the UK government in devolved areas. Let me turn then to the third area, which is notifications. Back in the fifth Senate, a protocol was established between our predecessor committee and Welsh government to help manage the increased volume of subordinate legislation arising from the EU exit. So in November 2020, the protocol was revised to become the vehicle by which the Welsh Government committed to following the principle of the Standing Order 30C process. Whenever the Welsh Ministers agreed to consent to regulations made by UK Ministers and the various other EU-related, uh, exit-related acts, so such as, for example, the Agriculture Act 2020, Fisheries Act 2020, the Trade Act 2021, and so on. Now, that protocol ceased to exist at the end of the Fifth Senate, but we had further discussions at the start of the Sixth Senate, and in November 2021, the First Minister made a commitment that, and I quote, the Welsh Government will write to our committee, the LJC committee, and other relevant committees to inform them of an intention to consent to the UK Government exercising a delegated legislative power in a devolved area in relation to Wales, explaining the rationale for the intention to consent. Where time allows this, this goes on, we will provide an opportunity for the Senate to express a view before consent is formally given, where time allows. Further, the Welsh Government will lay a written statement in relation to every exercise of a delegated legislative power by a UK minister in the devolved area to which Welsh ministers have given consent, explaining for that rationale for that consent, normally within three working days of the laying before or notification to the UK Parliament. So, which brings us to where we are. So in the current position, if we look back at the sixth Senate from May 2021, after the election, to July 2022, no statutory instrument consent memoranda and the Standing Order 30A were laid before the Senate. The Welsh Government has, to the end of July 2022, notified us of 28 UK Government SIs making provision in devolved areas, often for example, in policy areas linked to the environment or agriculture. And of these, 11 were made under the 2018 Act and therefore triggered Standing Order 30C. So having set up the process and some of the analysis of where we've been over the last year or so, what can we actually do? What's the outcome in terms of scrutiny? Well, I mentioned earlier on and emphasized the First Minister telling us that where time allows, the Welsh Government will provide an opportunity for the Senate to express a view before consent to regulations is given. Now, to date, such opportunities have not arisen. And as a committee, we're often informed of consent having already been given. Even this week, for example, we considered, and excuse the long title of this, the animals, food, plant, health, plant propagator material and seeds, brackets, miscellaneous amendments, etc., 
regulations of 2022. There'll be some people in this audience getting excited over that. They are made by UK ministers under the 2018 Act in devolved areas, and therefore they trigger standard order 30C. So we are now writing to the Welsh Government to seek clarity on some important issues raised by the statement. However, the statement told us that consent had already been given and the, re the regulations were made the day after we received notification. And another example, quite an important one, concerns regulations coming forward to amend the scope of the United Kingdom Internal Market Act 2020. It's a piece of legislation, by the way, to which the Senate refused to give its consent. So on Monday, in our committee, we considered a letter from Welsh Government sent during the summer recess, saying it had consented to the UK Internal Market Act 2020 bracket exclusions from market access principles services regulations 2022. Now this means that the Senate was not asked for its views on these regulations, even though the Act significantly affects the practical impact of legislation made by the Senate. And again, our committee is seeking clarity from Welsh Government on these important issues raised by these regulations. But Ruth, seeking information or clarity through correspondence is at the moment the most we can do. The opportunity to affect change is limited because not only are there significant time constraints in play, but the legislation is made in another parliament. We can and do raise issues with other committees in the UK parliament and the Clarkin team to the credit have built really productive work in relationships with officials supporting subordinate legislation, for example, in the House of Lords. However, unsurprisingly, the scheduling of business varies between parliaments, which when coupled with governments working at different speeds, sometimes the different timetables, makes the prospect of coordinated activity pretty remote. But nevertheless, we keep on trying to make use of the opportunities when they arise, particularly with a view to highlighting how legislation made at Westminster and devolved areas impacts on the Senate's legislative functions. Ruth, if I got time, just a couple of other concerns and challenges which exist before closing. Just a couple. Intergovernmental working, which you mentioned. Well, intergovernmental working on devolved matters excludes the Senate. The bypassing of the Senate's legislative functions because of provision being made in devolved areas at Westminster is a really big issue for us, and we speak about it regularly. And secondly, the matter of the pending retained EU law brackets revocation and reform bill. It is casting a long, long shadow from Westminster and its impact will be something we will be considering over the next few weeks, particularly in terms of issues surrounding matters of consent and the role of the Senate. I hope that helps as a flavor of what we've been doing, what we continue to do, and the limitations and constraints on us uh, in um, exercising uh, our powers as a Senate. Great, thank you, Hugh. That was that was a really good introduction to some of the some of the challenges. Um, I'm going to turn before we we, we are getting um, some questions that are relevant to to that. Um, I'm going to turn first though to to Michael to give us the perspective from Scotland and obviously from the perspective of somebody who's outside the the Parliament um, and uh, but deals as a as a lawyer and deals with the a lot of sort of the constitutional issues that. Uh, that the Parliament has to deal with, and you, you know, scrutinising a lot of the, the legislation and so on. And um, so, Michael, your thoughts on uh, on where things are in Scotland? Thank you very much indeed, Ruth. Um, what can one say? Um, uh, which will take eight minutes. I'm not really quite sure. Um, but I really admired Hugh's brave effort to uh, to do that, um, and uh, much of the material which Hugh told us about in relation to the, uh, the Welsh Parliament Senate uh, is um, pertinent to the Scottish situation. Uh, some of the solutions sound similar, although, of course, uh, things are slightly different in Scotland uh, from those in Wales. Uh, so, of course, in, in uh, 1998, when the Scottish Parliament was established, uh, there were uh, very limited provisions for UK ministers to make um, subordinate legislation, principally in connection with, with EU matters, um, uh, which would apply in uh, Scottish devolved terms. Um, uh, but um, uh, that, that power, uh, which was uh, 
regularly used with the Scottish Government's consent for Brexit um, it has, of course, changed since Brexit. Uh, and uh, we've seen the emergence of the use of joint powers um, uh, under the uh, European Union Withdrawal Act, EUWA, as I'll refer to it. Uh, and that was specifically focused on sections, uh, section eight and section nine uh, and schedule two, which uh, gave uh, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish um, uh, uh, ministers, executives, uh, the uh, the opportunity to uh, legislate uh, for clearing up deficiencies in EU law as it was transposed into uh, retained uh, EU law uh, at, at uh, the, the domestic UK level. Uh, that, uh, that particular provision of the EUWA um, was one which it gave rise to a protocol arrangement in much the same way as Hugh has described, um, it, which applies uh, in Scotland uh, to this day. Um, it, the, uh, it provides for uh, a notification provision uh, by uh, Scottish ministers to the parliament um, uh, and uh, the relevant uh, lead committee uh, of uh, a UK uh, proposal to legislate by subordinate legislation um, uh, on a matter which is within devolved power and competence. Uh, Scottish ministers uh, uh, have to set out certain aspects of, of uh, the legislation, uh, what it will do, um, what it will cost, the impact elements of it, um, uh, and various other uh, concerns. Um, I, I think it's important for us to appreciate that uh, when uh, that notification is given, uh, to the Scottish Parliament, uh, there are uh, a number of, of hoops which uh, uh, the, the government has to go through. Um, it, it's categorised as to whether uh, it's uh, of uh, extraordinary importance or lesser importance for reasons of por uh, proportionality. Uh, there are two types uh, of pr process uh, which can be gone through, one where there's more scrutiny uh, and the other where there is less. Um, and it's important that, that we also consider that the, uh, the protocol provides for Scottish ministers to give reasons for um, allowing the UK government to make uh, an SI within a, a devolved area of competence. Now, there can be very many reasons for that. The objectives of the devolved uh, government, uh, uh, Scottish government, and uh, the uh, the UK government align uh, uh, that uh, there may be no good reasons for having separate Scottish uh, subordinate legislation, um, uh, and there are a couple of examples uh, from uh, protocol um, uh, notification letters which I could offer you uh, to give you uh, an insight into the way in which the Scottish government was thinking about these reasons. For example, under the Fisheries Amendment EU exit regulations of 2019, uh, Scottish ministers recognised the requirement for amendments to create deficiencies in UK domestic legislation um, uh, and uh, that uh, they would be uh, bringing forward SSIs, that Scottish statutory instruments, to ensure that Scottish legislation continues to be operable after exit day. But um, in terms of the, uh, the that particular regulation, it represented only a temporary fix to allow sustainable management of commercial sea fishing uh, uh, to continue in the UK. And so the, the ministers were content that the current draft of the regulations fully respected the devolution settlement. Uh, another uh, 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 regulation was the Organic Products Regulation uh, of uh, 2019. And again, uh, the, uh, uh, the Scottish Government uh, considered that it makes sense to address the deficiencies through a UK SI. Uh, Scotland didn't have distinct issues needed handing, handling separately from the rest of the UK. So there's a, a, an element of legislative efficiency which comes into play uh, in the rationale for allowing the UK uh, government to legislate in this way. Uh, and uh, finally, in, in my own bailiwick, uh, an, a European enforcement order uh, for payment and small claims procedure 
uh, amendment regulations of 2018 uh, and uh, the uh, Scottish ministers considered expressly uh, for reasons of efficiency that consent should be given to Scotland's inclusion in that particular statutory instrument. Uh, so these are the sorts of considerations which Scottish ministers would apply in saying yes uh, to the, uh, the regulations being dealt with in that way. Politically uncontroversial regulations, probably, that is, is another factor which features in ministers' minds, um, uh, allowing uh, the government uh, to, uh, to uh, the UK government to make SIs within devolved competence uh, essentially would be contributing to effective and efficient government. These, um, these provisions, uh, I think, are, are quite important. And when one considers that the, uh, the various uh, uh, lead committees and particularly the delegated, uh, the Law Reform and Delegated Legislation Committee of the Parliament, which deals with an immense number of statutory instruments in the course of a year, um, uh, one uh, would like to know that, that uh, over the period of the years 2018-19 through to 21-22, uh, the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, has considered uh, a total of 83 instruments uh, laid under the EU uh, Withdrawal Act. So um, it, it's not an insubstantial number, um, and it uh, effectively worked without much in the way of controversy where the committee would reject uh, the notification uh, from the government that uh, there should be some kind of uh, uh, allowance for the UK government to legislate in this way. Um, if, uh, the, uh, if that were to happen, um, uh, that uh, in the scenario which uh, Hugh had painted, uh, there, there is a provision in the Scottish Protocol uh, that uh, the, the, uh, if the order is passed without consent being given, that it is to go back to the, uh, to the Parliament and that Parliament uh, will, uh, will be advised that the UK uh, instrument had been made. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, it, it could, of course, uh, vote to reject the instrument, uh, but uh, that I do not think has yet happened. I should also say that, that uh, uh, the uh, DPLR committee uh, has recently been thinking about uh, the continuity of the protocol, given that most uh, of the EUWA legislation uh, has now been, been made um, uh, and uh, that uh, the emphasis is shifting towards instruments which uh, relate to the new policy direction in post-EU areas. Whether there will be another uh, uh, protocol to deal with legislation in these new areas is another matter and we have to deal with in the meantime things like the professional uh, qualifications act of uh, last year uh, and and uh, the uh, the internal market act of course um, uh, which contain provisions for uk ministers to make uh, subordinate legislation uh, without the need for taking the the consent uh, of the parliament uh, although there may be consultation requirements. I hope that's of sufficient interest at the moment, Ruth. I think I may have just crossed the line on my time. That's fine. That's great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I'm going to move on to Stephen um, and invite him to give his perspective on Northern Ireland, where obviously the situation is slightly different in terms of uh, the, the political situation and the, the future of, uh, of the Assembly and its, its, its life with the possibility of elections later this month. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, you can submit questions through the Q&A function. So please do if you want to ask our panellists anything um, once Stephen's finished. So with that, Stephen, over to you. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruth, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I'm hopefully going to try to bridge my experiences um, in the Assembly and also more contemporary in, in, in Westminster. I maybe set out um, a few of the, the current um, controversies um, around all of this. Um, I mean, Ruth, uh, you, you, you enticed me at the start to just to stress that the, the Assembly in Northern Ireland at present isn't actually sitting. 
So in contrast to our friends in Scotland and Wales, um, we haven't had continuous uh, devolution since uh, 1999. In fact, the, the assembly has been non-functional for about 40% of, of that time, which is, which, which is quite something. Uh, and that certainly has inhibited the, the, the development of, of some of our um, pr processes. Um, before getting into to some of the, 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 the contemporary issues, let me just highlight my experience in terms of dealing with statutory instruments in both Westminster and, and the Assembly, maybe starting with the, with the Assembly. And sort of speaking as a, as a practicing politician as such, um, in many ways, it's, it's, it was strange actually that the level of attention that was actually given in the Assembly uh, to, to SIs was actually very, very low. Um, and uh, I say that almost as a criticism of my colleagues and that they perhaps were, were not giving as much attention to them as they, they should have been. Um, often, um, the SIs were considered by the, 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 the formal statutory committees in, in the Assembly, uh, but th that frequently happened towards the end of a long committee session where they were taking evidence from different um, groups coming in to talk about, about issues, which was all very important and, and worthy activity. But often the SIs were simply nodded through at the end. And then whenever um, an SI had to be, to be approved on the floor of the Assembly, it was done uh, with very little debate at times. Often um, a private member's debate would, would maybe take 90 minutes and parties would put forward a full range of speakers, but often the SIs were put through in 10 or 20 minutes without much uh, debate. So one, the, the first matter was simply just having a debate on an issue and taking a stance. Uh, the second one was about actually changing the law. So one would have thought that the attention would have been the, the other way around. Uh, similarly in Westminster, yeah, I mean, SIs don't get uh, much much coverage at all and they, they, are, they are marginalized in terms of delicate legislation um, committees. I think perhaps the most useful thing to stress from my perspective, and I speak for what is the smallest uh, political party in, in Westminster, uh, in that um, many of the processes in Parliament um, are controlled by, by the three largest parties. Um, at, at this moment in time, the Conservatives, Labour and an SNP. So whether we're talking about the select committees or delegated legislation committees. Um, the places on those uh, tend to be carved out amongst the, the three uh, largest parties. So it's very rare that uh, I or my colleagues from any of the other smaller parties would have direct membership of those. Um, I sit on the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, uh, but that place was, was kindly um, allocated by, by Labour or SNP, giving up some of their allocation for the Northern Ireland parties. And occasionally, whenever we have a dedicated legislation um, a committee looking at a, a piece, an SI that's very specific to Northern Ireland, uh, either Labour or SNP will give up some of their places to the Northern Ireland political parties. But there's no requirement for them to do so, but, but it's something they've, they've done uh, generously. Of course, we can't go along and, and, and speak anyway without being a formal uh, voting member of, of, of the committee. Um, at present, there's quite a few issues in, in the mix at, at present, um, which relate to uh, statutory uh, instruments. Um, and I think someone in the chat was talking about there about a SEAL convention for, for SIs, which I would uh, certainly uh, endorse. But in a broader sense, the SEAL convention at present is, isn't really being observed at all um, when it comes to a number of very important uh, pieces of legislation uh, that are moving through um, uh, Westminster. Uh, but ones often with uh, statutory instruments uh, on, on the back of those. Obviously, we had the Internal Market Bill, um, which has shaped the landscape in, in, in terms of how the uh, UK Internal Market Bill is going to be taken forward. That has particular complications within Northern Ireland versus the, um, the requirements under the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, we we're also having, for example, the, the, the Legacy Bill going forward at, at present. Um, which was originally envisaged to be something that was done almost by Westminster as a hybrid bill alongside the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, given that justice issues, color, um, particularly when it comes to dealing with um, the legacy of Northern Ireland's past, cut across both Westminster and the Assembly. So it was easier for Westminster to legislate on behalf of the two bodies rather than the Northern Ireland Assembly trying to do something alongside Westminster. But we now have the situation where the Westminster Parliament is imposing an outcome of the heads of the Northern Ireland parties and the assembly, all five of the, of the parties. We've also seen what are, to my mind, 
much more benign interventions, but nonetheless, ones that have been controversial uh, around, for example, the Executive Formation Act that was put through in 2019, whenever um, the Assembly was down. And that included uh, enabling powers uh, around a whole range of social policy reforms that for various reasons had been blocked inside the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, around equal marriage and uh, reproductive rights abortion reform. Um, I personally welcome that intervention to ensure we had a common human rights standards across the UK, but there were elements within Northern Ireland that were we saw those as being a, a major um, in interference. But I suppose the, probably the, the most complex aspect relates to, to Brexit itself and beyond the wider issues about um, SIs dealing with Brexit across the UK, which some of it will apply to Northern Ireland, where they're outside of the, of the terms of the protocol. Um, nonetheless, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, uh, which I am pragmatic around and understand why it's there, uh, that poses uh, some very significant issues in terms of how some SIs are taken forward to Westminster and that they don't include uh, Northern Ireland because there's a different regime. But equally, there's also requirements on the protocol for the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, to ensure that it keeps up to date with its requirements under the protocol um, where uh, aspects of EU law that apply under, under the protocol need to be um, updated or something new comes along. There are aspects that will, that will automatically apply um, to Northern Ireland whenever um, Brussels updates them, but there'll be other areas where the Northern Ireland Assembly does need to intervene. And there are concerns if there's default in that regard, what that means for the integrity of the protocol going forward. I suppose that brings, um, that also raises an issue around um, the democratic deficit in Northern Ireland in that um, often uh, there's EU law that is being shaped and reshaped uh, over which Northern Ireland representatives don't have any direct say, um, but not, are nonetheless required to, to implement. Now, I mean, that to me is, is one of the side effects of, of Brexit and, 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 and the protocol and something we probably need to take on the chin. But there is some degree of discussions with Brussels as to how to give a, a greater, um, almost early warning mechanism for, for Northern Ireland uh, and better representatives to have an input, and in particular for the, the Northern Ireland stakeholders in the development um, of that. And that then brings me to probably like the final piece, which is the, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which probably would merit an entire session in, in, in its own right. Um, there are massive implications uh, from this piece of legislation. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, there are genuine concerns about the, the nature of this bill in the sense that um, it is almost entirely an, an enabling bill. Um, and everything is to be done through uh, through regulations and uh, and there's also very su substantive head the eighth powers. So people are rightly exercised uh, by what that means and uh, the press and that type of approach is, is, is setting. And um, I suppose the second issue as well is, is, is more the political one that uh, what this amounts to is a, a, a unilateral rewriting of the protocol. Uh, over the heads of the Northern Ireland Assembly, um, who have taken a view um, that they don't want the protocol unpicked. Um, and uh, I mean, this is uh, any SIs of flow from this uh, will be interfering with some of the, the devolved uh, areas. So it's, it's uh, doubly uh, controversial uh, in that regard. So thank you very much and look forward to your questions. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, well, if any of our uh, viewers want to read a bit more about the, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. I mean, the Hansel Society, we did a bill briefing for MPs uh, when it was up in the Commons and uh, before summer recess, and we described the powers in that as breathtaking. Now, we don't we do not do hyperbole, generally, <laughs> um, but I'm afraid on that bill, um, they were they were very you know, breathtaking. Um, and our, our briefing paper reflects that. So you can download that from our from our website. And the bill is is up in the House of Lords uh, when the, 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 the Lords return uh, after the conference recess. So we'll see what see what happens in the Lords. But I suspect it will take quite a quite a hammering. Um, so to questions, um, we've had one that was also something on my list that I was going to, going to ask. Um, recently, the, the Scottish Parliament's Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee um, published a report on the impact of Brexit on devolution. And reading that, one of the things that came through in the discussion about uh, statutory instruments um, was whether or not there should be a Sewell Convention for secondary legislation. 
uh, whether that offered any kind of solution. And Stephen, you, you referenced it in your comments. Um, so my question to all of you would be, um, what do you think about that? And given the problems with how the Sewell Convention has worked at the primary legislation level, um, perhaps that's not the right route to go down. And if, if not, what perhaps ought we to be looking for? Who wants to, who wants to go first? Oh, there, my, Michael, off you go. Well, uh, given that uh, Lord Sewell was a Scotland office minister, I uh, suppose uh, um, we have to take uh, some of the some of the responsibility for that. I happen to have been in uh, the advisors box in the House of Lords in the, in July uh, of uh, ninety eight when uh, Lord Sewell made the comment, uh, which became associated with his name, um, and. Um, and of course, he was relying on uh, something which goes back through history, through colonial administration, um, a, a famous case of Madsen Bambuto v. Lardner Burke of 1963, which related to uh, Rhodesia's parliament. Uh, and of course, uh, it was in operation in the Northern Ireland parliament uh, uh, 100 years ago, um, uh, in, in 1921, until that parliament uh, was uh, dissolved. So um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's got a long heritage of, of operation. Uh, and until um, Brexit, um, it, uh, it had a long heritage of successful operation uh, in, in, the, in the UK with, uh, in relation to legislation which was being passed. But it does not apply to subordinate legislation. It's quite clear. Devolution Guidance Note 10 makes it clear that it only applies to primary legislation. Uh, and, and I think that that's uh, part of the problem um, uh, when, when we're dealing with this is to try to, to, to use existing models for getting some kind of, of um, a comity between the, the legislatures. Um, a, a, and it's a legislature to legislature issue. It's not a government to legislature issue uh, in that sense. Um, uh, so the uh, so I, I think that we should probably be looking in another way and, and we should be looking in a government to government uh, aspect that it sh that if there's going to be something which achieves uh, the same sort of aim uh, as uh, the legislative consent convention, but for subordinate legislation, it would have to be a government to government aspect. And that really takes us to the intergovernmental um, uh, uh, arrangements which currently exist. Uh, and, uh, and out of those, um, there aren't very many success stories in the recent past either uh, because of the, uh, uh, the, the gulf, the political gulf which exists uh, between uh, the uh, UK government and uh, the devolved administrations in one way or another uh, across the UK. Uh, and uh, so what, what's the successful one? The successful one is common frameworks. Uh, I think everyone agrees that, that uh, uh, the creation of common frameworks, the design, their implementation uh, and uh, their amendment uh, is something which has, has worked. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, principally due to the, the civil servants who work very well together um, uh, putting uh, forward a package in relation to what are significantly technical pieces of, of work um, uh, to, uh, for, for ministers to agree. Uh, can, we, can we anticipate that applying to subordinate legislation, uh, which is under, let's say, the Internal Market Act uh, or the Professional Qualifications Act or the Trade Act? And that's a, a more difficult ask because of the elements of controversiality which might be uh, uh, applying here uh, and it, so I think we what we need to do is to uh, take this issue to uh, the uh, the authors of the uh, the intergovernmental relationship uh, and say to them what do you suggest to improve this situation uh, because it cannot go on uh, with um, our government making law without taking into account the democratic wishes of a demo another democratically elected government. 
and I think that that's it, that's beyond my pay grade. I'm I'm only a lawyer. Um, uh, I only work for the Law Society of Scotland, and I can tell you most things are beyond my pay grade. Um, uh, but uh, it's I think it's important that that it is owned by the governments, uh, and it's up to the governments to find a solution. Thanks, Michael. Hugh. You're muted. That's great. Uh, that's bad. Thank you. Um, yeah, just following on from what Michael is saying, I, I mean, I, I've lost track of the number of times that uh, colleagues of mine on the committee and other Senate members have referred now to the fact that the uh, civil convention is uh, broken or is as good as because of experience over recent years uh, in terms of, uh, not in terms of secondary regulations as we're talking about today, but actually in terms of uh, the, the main business of legislation. So on that basis of recognizing the two world convention was a thing of its time, but it's really predicated on very good uh, relationships between developed parliaments and, uh, and governments as well, that there's a sort of mutual respect where that you will not tread over a line or when it, when it is done, it is truly exceptional um, rather than commonplace. So rather than look at, could we apply the civil convention to um, uh, secondary regulations and statutory instances and so on, maybe we do need to be looking at some of the things Michael was touching on there, which is more formal procedures. Uh, what I would say is more um, mature reflection of the way the UK should uh, now work. Um, that that um, respect for uh, competences, that respect both ways, by the way, um, is embedded somehow uh, in, in very clear uh, ways to do it. Now, some of that is undoubtedly um, through putting legislative uh, consent motions on secondary regulations, but as I've said already, we don't see um, many of those. I think, I think at the moment that the, um, the procedure committee uh, is looking at some of the issues of consent, so maybe it could turn its attention to this as well. But I think there is a job now for parliamentary committees uh, to try and advocate for, to put their heads together and say, well, what are the better ways to go forward than relying on understandings and conventions, which depending on the character of individual governments and parliaments at any particular time can be cast aside a little bit too easily. Stephen, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah, just very briefly, and I mean, similar to, to you, I mean, we're talking about a, a, a situation where if, if there is restraint and, um, and on, on both sides, it, it probably could could work as as was if it was understood that um, what was happening was largely technical. I think where you, the government is crossing the line into taking what are overtly political. Uh, decisions um, that is where most of the upset is, is is going to flow and I suppose it goes back to the the, the, the dangers of a unwritten constitution and uh, relying on conventions and uh, so-called gentleman's agreements we've seen quite a lot of those boundaries being uh, shifted over the past number of years in the whole range of of areas and and, and, and this is one so uh, what we're seeing is, is is not just a gentle encroachment, but uh, more of a of, of a flood, and uh, that has uh, perhaps provoked the, the backlash. So, um, if this was done in in, in moderation, uh, that perhaps there wouldn't be the need for uh, a major rethink in terms of how this is done. Uh, but we're not seeing that, sadly. Can I just mention one other thing here: there there are a couple of useful platforms now or forums which this could be taken forward. Sorry, one is the mechanism Michael referred to earlier, the new intergovernmental machinery. That is really going to be tried and tested uh, on a range of issues in the coming months. And we, when we had the council uh, discussing this with the council general recently in Wales, uh, I, you know, I think there's a real acknowledgement that now that this has been put in place, this is the, uh, this could be the, the route through which not only UK stroke England, but also Scottish Northern Ireland Welsh ministers crash this step out. But the other thing is in, our, is in our hands, and there's been much talk over recent months about the rule that the successor to the former interparliamentary forum looking at Brexit issues could play. I think this is a real role for that to put forward from a parliamentary uh, perspective uh, the solutions we think would work. 
But I just do not think, to use a very old adage, this can rely on understandings and um, I use this genuinely advisedly, gentlemen's agreements or gentlewomen's agreements, it can't be done in that way anymore. A ma mature democracy would find mechanisms that make, make this work. Uh, but it, it's, it's going to require a lot of goodwill and hard work on all sides to, make, to find those solutions. Great. Just, just on that question of interparliamentary relations, you refer to the Interparliamentary Forum, which was established, I think, by the Lord Speaker, um, who's probably the most uh, probably the most prominent Scotsman in Westminster in terms of positions of office. Um, and he was very keen during the Brexit process to get representatives from the various relevant committees uh, of, the, of the four legislatures together. Um, and obviously he's looking at ways that with colleagues in the devolved legislatures, way that that can be built out. There's also a, a group that I'm involved in, the Study of Parliament group, which is a sort of body of academics and clerks who meet periodically to um, discuss um, these kinds of procedural challenges. And one of the things we're looking at is how interparliamentary relations might be improved and what, what mechanisms and model there might be. Um, we've had a question about this. So perhaps I could perhaps push you a little bit more on this question of interparliamentary relations and what the direction of travel might be. You know, how formal perhaps does it need to be? Um, you know, one option is should it should it in effect mirror the intergovernmental model and provide scrutiny of that, or should it be um broader than that because that wouldn't necessarily capture some of the issues we're talking about in terms of looking at the detail of statutory instruments when they're they're laid uh, by at Westminster and they're looking for consent from from the Scottish government or the the Northern Ireland executive and so on um so any any thoughts on that question about direction of travel for interparliamentary relations anybody want to pick up the <laughs> Can I maybe start, Ruth, but maybe just taking it at, a, at, a, at, a, at an even higher level. Um, there, is, there is a school of thought that says that um, notwithstanding sort of the, the, the wider debates in both Scotland and Wales around um, levels of devolution and, 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 and uh, indeed independence at some stage, uh, and whatever happens in, in Northern Ireland, that um, there is a need to, to put in place a much more formalised federal structure inside the UK. And that would encompass um, those intergovernmental relationships, um, uh, as well as, as, as many other things as well. And I certainly, I do think it would provide a much more solid um, framework. It probably does take it maybe uh, several notches beyond um, what may be required in terms of addressing the formal issue around SIs. So but I think it is a useful alternative sort of reference point in terms of if you're doing this on a blank sheet of paper, how would you go, go about it? And um, indeed to look at what happens in other jurisdictions internationally in terms of best practice as to what the, the correct um, balance uh, should be. But uh, short of that, yes, look, I mean, we do need to, to formalise uh, this in, 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 in some shape or form. Um, clearly it's shown that doing this through conventions is now probably broken and um, simply going back to, to perhaps a more benign time perhaps is, bit, is probably a bit naive. Thank you. Yeah, I've probably got to offer some personal thoughts rather than reflections of the committee. The committee isn't of uh, a set view. We haven't debated this in depth, although we've talked a lot about the potential of the Interparliamentary Forum and what it could now do. And I think it is fair to say on the LDC committee, uh, all of us um, see that there is a potential to go much further than purely having a, a useful, but in some ways fairly informal and limited agenda committee. There's a role for that as well, by the way, because the, this interparliamentary engagement also has to step up much more. We're conscious of that as a, a Wales-based committee. We're trying to make great efforts now to physically be in places and meet with other committees, both from the other nations uh, and regions of the UK, but also down in Westminster and to receive groups down here. But in terms of whether it should be a more formal structure or not, let me offer a personal perspective. I, I, I've been really um, uh, warmly surprised from the moment that the uh, Lord Speaker um, opened discussion on this at the uh, a meeting several months ago at people with long parliamentary experience in Westminster around uh, that table initially who advocated for 
very strong um, uh, reform of the Interparliamentary Forum uh, to mirror what was going on with intergovernmental machinery. And certainly some surprise in individuals were advocating putting it on a statutory footing. So that uh, this wasn't an opt in, opt out, um, come and go sort of thing. Um, we did the serious business of looking at, well, what is being discussed at interparliamentary, uh, at intergovernmental level? How can we help set the agenda, scrutinize them at, at, uh, together at source? Um, now, this is going to be bottomed out in future meetings, and there's one coming up shortly of the Interparliamentary Forum. I think, Ruth, picking up on the point you made, the discussions we have, we, we will have, could be really usefully informed by the work that you and others and other organisations are doing externally to put forward potential models. But I think there's an appetite now from um, parliamentarians to say, well, if government is going to step up to the mark in the way that it formalizes ways of working, then we cannot be left out as, uh, as nations uh, and uh, regions parliaments. We cannot, uh, because that is to allow them to get on with stuff uh, without us seeing transparently what they're doing. So my personal feeling is it needs to be um, quite a formalized, quite radical and agenda setting uh, forum, whatever it may be called. But there might also be a place, by the way, in the margins of that or separate from that, uh, uh, something that looks like a forum that allows for much looser exchange of wider issues so that we can talk not just about what's on the strict agenda, but bigger things that when parliament, parliamentarians get together, they want to scope out. Okay, great. Well, I'm sure uh, we'll have some of the study of Parliament group members, I think, on this uh, this webinar. So I'm sure they'll be picking that up and I'll feed that back at our next meeting, which I think is this Friday. So uh, make sure that that's fed in. Michael, do you detect any interest in, in, in sort of demand in, in Scotland for improved interparliamentary relations? Is that something that stakeholders are calling for or as, as well as members? Well, I, I think there's a genuine recognition that uh, interparliamentary relations is is one of one of the more uh, unexpected and pleasurable uh, potential uh, in meeting places for for ideas to be exchanged. Ruth um, and uh, Lord McFall um, in the original uh, manifestation of this uh, during. Uh, the early days of Brexit was was uh, uh, to be to be seen uh, talking to the, the conveners of of uh, our Con financial constitution committee Bruce Crawford and his deputy uh, convener uh, Adam Tompkins um, uh, at uh, so bringing together uh, people uh, from from the committees uh, was a genuinely good idea and I think um, it, the uh, the way in which that concept has now uh, grown with the Interparliamentary Forum is, is a mark uh, of Lord McFall's tenacity and uh, for, uh, foresightedness. Um, and how foresighted could it be that, that uh, in the agenda for uh, the, uh, the statement which was made after that first meeting to which you referred in February, that, that the impact of the new constitutional arrangements uh, on the legislative process, including uh, the use of secondary powers and the legislative consent process should be one of the uh, the issues for the agenda. So, um, effectively, writing the script for this part of this meeting uh, today. Um, and if if one thinks that that uh, uh, in the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, there is room for a, a, a parliamentary uh, discussion forum between uh, you, the UK Parliament. Uh, and European uh, parliamentary members, uh, then I think uh, this is an idea whose time has come. Uh, so, um, bearing that in mind, uh, the, uh, the the recent report uh, on the impact of Brexit uh, by the uh, Constitution European uh, uh, Europe uh, External Relations and uh, Culture Committee um, uh, also uh, made reference to uh, the, the need for um, uh, parliamentary relations to be examined. And I think uh, Professor Tierney's uh, comments uh, can be seen in, in that report, which refer to the importance of interparliamentary relations 
Um, so, uh, yes, th there is, I think, an appetite. Um, uh, there is, I think, something which tells us that, that uh, uh, interparliamentary uh, relations is as important as intergovernmental relations, um, uh, and that uh, we should be uh, doing all we can to make sure that uh, there is a exchange of ideas, a discussion uh, of ideas, and uh, the, uh, uh, the the emergence of some kind of, of uh, uh, sense of agreement as to what might be best practice in dealing with matters of legislative consent and use of secondary legislation powers. Michael, in your opening remarks, you talked about common frameworks and how they might um, pose some, some um, examples, some, some lessons that could be taken in relation to um, dealing with, with delegated legislation as well. Um, in terms of how um, these things are scrutinised. We had a question about that, essentially what, what the assessment is that you would make of, of common legislative frameworks post-Brexit and are, are, are there any lessons to be learned? So can I just ask Hugh and Stephen if they've got any thoughts on that in respect of their jurisdictions? Stephen, do you want to go first? Yeah. yeah um... I mean, this has been reasonably uncontroversial uh, in the midst of quite a lot of controversy um, around uh, the Brexit and protocol issues and, and internal markets. So it, it, it did work um, reasonably well. I think I think this worth stressing, um, particularly Dublin for Northern Ireland, which is obviously the smallest of the three um, devolved um, uh, setups, in that um, at, at times um, in quite small departments, there, there can be a welcome for. Um, the template, at least, uh, or indeed action at a Westminster level in terms of a Saturday instrument rather than having to do a process um, in, independently. So this isn't always seen as a, as a threat or, or encroachment. There can at times be benefits from this um, as, as well. And uh, there's been a number of times very controversial when Northern Ireland has done things differently, where we end up in a, in a real, real mess, like a, the renewable heat initiative uh, being, being one, one example. It wasn't part of the, the, the common frameworks issue. But it, it does go to this point that at times, just in terms of civil service being stressed with a lot of pressures and sometimes not necessarily having the inbuilt technical knowledge themselves, um, there is an advantage um, to this. And uh, particularly in that the college frameworks process where it was accepted that they were largely technical uh, it wasn't seen as being as being threatening so th there can be some advantages Thank you. yeah the, the first observation is that we're, we're sort of late to the day in common frameworks and then there's been a sudden rush but um it's just an observation if we have common frameworks in place then some of the additional legislation we're looking at uh, uh, now about making the UK work may not have been wholly necessary, but that's a slight aside. Um, it's early days, um, but we, we do have some good hopes for common frameworks because we do see them, and we always did see them, a predecessor committee as well, as a way in which you make this joint up nature work across the UK work very effectively, um, and without, without necessarily the need for uh, resorting to dispute procedures or ramping it up through tiers of different uh, uh, standing intergovernmental committees and, and so on. Um, they're at a very different stage of preparedness, uh, uh, however. Some of the ones that have come through uh, uh, vary slightly in their content and their quality as well and their depth. Um, so they're, they're going to be tested. It's too early to say yet, yet Ruth, whether they they're successful. Have we got have we got really good examples? Because I think the truth of this will be 12 months down the line, 18 months down the line, and to see if these are being used properly um, and are delivering results that don't have to resort to other measures. But we, we do have great hopes in them. And as I say, our predecessor committee, uh, committee as well, um, hope that this would be one of the ways forward. So we've had another question covering uh, treaties and scrutiny of treaties. Um, so, um, Hugh, you touched um, initially in your opening remarks about the Senate's work on, on scrutinising treaties. And, and the question is, is what practical steps can be taken to address the multiple scrutiny gaps where UK statutory instruments are being used to implement treaties that cover devolved issues? So treaty scrutiny at Westminster is a, is a big challenge. 
Um, what, what's the situation in, in each of your jurisdictions on, on that question? Anybody want to go first? Hugh, Michael, Steve? <laughs> I'll have to pick one. <laughs> Michael, Michael volunteered. Excellent. Thank you. Why not? Why not? <laughs> um, uh, uh, because I'll leave it to real experts to, to fill in the gaps that I leave. Um, uh, after me. Um, uh, so uh, the um, uh, Scotland Act 1998, Schedule 5, Paragraph 7, uh, says that uh, the formulation of treaties uh, is reserved, uh, but the implementation of treaties is devolved, essentially. Um, uh, and so uh, there is a, a limited uh, space uh, for the Scottish Parliament uh, and the Scottish Government to, to operate here um, uh, other than to implement uh, the, uh, the, the agreement uh, between the UK and another state um, uh, to, uh, uh, and make it work in, uh, the, uh, in, in Scotland um, uh, under the, the legal arrangements which are made by the Parliament. Now that, uh, that I think is, is the starting point and it, um, exculpates uh, the uh, Scottish Government and Parliament uh, from uh, any difficulties which may arise from the actual formulation of the treaty. Um, uh, and uh, the formulation of the treaty, of course, uh, is a, uh, a responsibility of the Crown. Um, uh, and under our dualist system, uh, the Crown uh, makes the agreement with um, uh, another uh, state uh, and then um, it, it essentially uh, brings home the agreement uh, ready made um, uh, for Parliament to uh, implement into the law. Uh, and uh, we're seeing some of that at the moment with the Australia and New Zealand trade bill, uh, um, uh, trade agreement deal bill, which is, is currently uh, going through Parliament um, uh, under the quite inadequate provisions. Uh, for, for for scrutiny, which we ordinarily see uh, uh, under the Constitution Reform uh, and uh, Governance Act, um, uh, there, there is uh, a very little room for Parliament to reject um, the, uh, the treaty at all. Uh, it can essentially keep it going uh, on a sort of 28-day cycle or something like that, if my memory serves me right. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it cannot strike it out uh, and it cannot send it back to be reworded because the agreement has been made and the wording is set. So there is a problem over uh, the way in which uh, the UK deals with international agreements uh, and, uh, uh, and how democratic that process is. Um, uh, we have made suggestions in the past to House of Lords committees uh, and, and, uh, and also in the Scottish Parliament, when uh, the uh, uh, the original um, EU agreement with uh, the, the US was was uh, being proposed, uh, that there should be some better form, better way to do this, uh, and to inject some democratic input, regular reporting by the uh, negotiating team, the setting of the negotiating mandate uh, to be subject to parliamentary approval. These sorts of things. It could easily improve the nature of uh, international agreement making uh, and make it more democratic. But uh, it, there doesn't seem to be much appetite for taking on some of these potential reforms on board. Kim? Yeah, I, I agree. We're, we're limited in, in, in what we can practically. Uh, do and that lack of appetite for sort of major reform of the uh, the role of the developed governments and or parliaments in agenda setting and meaningful engagement on things like uh, non trade international agreements and, uh, and so on. Uh, um, that that is a challenge. We have to we have to be realistic about where we are. But what we what we have tried to do from a Wales perspective is a couple of things. One of them is facing up the um, upwards from Wales towards uh, the UK Parliament, and the other one is what we're doing internally 
So we're trying um, within the resource constraints we have to flag um, any issues, any concerns uh, directly and in a timely way uh, with um, committees in both the House of Lords and the House of Commons so that they can take them on. I have to say it's been, it's been productive and very helpful um, or even to flag it uh, directly with ministers on occasion as well at the other end of the end four, not just with our own ministers. Now it seems quite cheeky and presumptuous, particularly doing the ministerial, but sometimes we feel it's worth um, having a go. But certainly the the engagement with um, uh, parliamentary committees is something we're trying to do. So we put it on the agenda and we make them aware of what's going on. I have to say our experiences, uh, particularly with some of the House of Lords committees, but also with the House of Commons, um, it, it's the committees that are increasingly very aware of, of the impacts of what's been done at the UK level down down the road um, or across the water in Northern Ireland or down the road. Um, the other thing is internally, we we managed to gain a commitment in relation to primary legislation in the Senate. It came out of one particular bill, the Professional Qualifications Bill, uh, under Recommendation 9, where it says where UK bills that are the subject of Welsh Government legislative consent memoranda, where they interconnect with domestic or international arrangements. Welsh Government should make this clear and provide details in the relevant memorandum, um, so, and that they will make this clear in future memorandums. So now that's a help internally in flagging this, uh, not just for us, but for all Senate members. Um, so we're trying to do what we can, but we gotta be realistic, as Michael was saying, uh, the actual practical things we can do are fairly constrained. You mentioned their um, House of Commons committees um, making some progress, some headway with uh, with their sort of thinking about these issues. So, um, in a very timely way, I've been prodded to give a plug to the fact that the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee is considering this question of, of international agreement scrutiny and, and the role of the devolved institutions in that process and uh, apparently he's going to hold an evidence session on this issue in November, so um, so watch this space. Stephen, do you want to add anything to uh, to that? No, it's pretty much been well answered so far, so largely in, in concurrence. Okay. Um, we've had a question about um, the, the extent to which the devolved governments are using um, delegated legislation, statutory instruments. Um, obviously, a, Significant issue at Westminster is the degree to which the UK government is using SIs uh, increasingly. So it's an, you know an, a debate, a live debate about the extent to which so much uh, is being done through delegated legislation, and obviously is also doing things uh, in areas of devolved competence. And um, so, are the devolved governments making increasing use of statutory instruments themselves? Um, is it a pattern that's that's mirrored or actually is it is it primarily a Westminster driven problem? Hugh, you're nodding quite uh, quite a bit there. So <laughs> do you want to get yeah, can, I, can I direct you? Can I give an advertisement towards our forthcoming annual report? We've committed as a, a LJC committee now to wrap up our year's deliberations each September, October in an annual report. It's an innovation we've done this year. And we turn to this very matter, yes. We see it, and we're quite, we're quite um, uh, blunt but factual uh, in our analysis of the increasing numbers of SIs that um, Welsh Government is using to do, do, deliver quite significant policy, uh, including in things, and we've had major debates on this in the Senate, things like the Welsh Tax Act, so a tax policy in Wales. So we, we do appreciate, by the way, in something like the Welsh Tax Act, this is, uh, in some ways, a very whole new, not, if not a new sphere, a very recent um, uh, sphere for Welsh Government to start developing its own thinking about how it takes those forward. So we're trying to help as a committee and saying we think we've got some ways and we're spelling it out to them how it is. But yes, not just in Welsh Tax Act, but increasingly across a range of areas, uh, we see the Welsh Government using their signs to deliver quite significant policy areas. Um, as a committee, we flag it, we regularly speak in it in the Senate. I think we've probably got a lot of support of parliamentarians who also agree with this, right across all the parties, that this is a worrying development. So um, just a quick, um, uh, 
quick fact for you. Um, over the last period I referred to, so this last roughly year period, we've had over 230 SIs delivered by Welsh Government. The equivalent period in the same period in the last Senate was just over 110. Stephen, is it something that you're noticing in Northern Ireland? Yes, um, I mean, it is an increasing feature of our um, legislation, I suppose. Um, as will be the case of Westminster, we, we just need a balanced approach to it. There will be circumstances in which using SIs is appropriate for areas of particular detail or where um, we, particular um, aspects of policy are, are going to be changing frequently. Uh, and it allows uh, to avoid going back to re for repeated um, primary um, le legislation. I mean, whenever I was a minister and putting forward um, legislation, um, when I was in, at times inclined to, to put in broad enabling powers for S SIs because it did seem a neater way of doing things and, and keeping options, options open. Um, I mean, there are uh, also in Northern Ireland uh, fairly strong requirements for public consultation around development of policy, and that will still apply um, to to SI. So it isn't entirely just a uh, something that happens in in a very limited um, uh, capacity. Um, so there can often be public debates, but to still go back to the point made at the start, at times often the MLAs will um, we have them through without too much debate and scrutiny, notwithstanding the fact that there has been a wider uh, public policy process and consultation um, around them. So, like like everything in life, uh, in, in in moderation, they're fine. <laughs> Michael, any uh, any thoughts for from the Scotland perspective? Well, of course, there is a, a general trend for most bills to have some kind of of uh, regulation making power given to Scottish ministers. Um, I, I cannot remember a bill um, in uh, 20 years of working uh, in uh, the Scottish Parliament that didn't have that kind, uh, some kind of regulation making power in it. Uh, but uh, I was uh, um, uh, really interested in uh, what happened during the coronavirus time uh, and uh, under the coronavirus legislation in Scotland, in 2020, there were 148 uh, Scottish statutory instruments, and in uh, 21, there were 222 uh, uh, Scottish statutory instruments. Now, that's a, as against a UK total in uh, in uh, 2020 of 278, as opposed to 148 in Scotland, uh, and in uh, 21 of 422 UK statutory instruments is against 222. Uh, Scottish statutory instruments, um, and many of these, of course, were made affirmative ones, mm -hmm. uh, which is another story yet again in the uh, the desirability question uh, about some aspects of um, uh, subordinate legislation making, uh, and I have no doubt that they were all uh, bona fide uh, emergency uh, pieces of legislation to deal with an emergency situation, uh, but um, uh, it's it's the explanation of that um, uh, emergency which is important. And uh, Scottish ministers, during the course of one of the bills uh, last year, um, I think it was last year, it might have been earlier this year, no, it was last year, um, uh, were uh, uh, accepted that they would uh, provide a statement of reasons for uh, the, uh, the the need to use made affirmative legislation. So um, that that helps to inform uh, those who are making this law, the parliamentarians, um, uh, as to uh, why this legislation is urgent or not. Um, uh, and uh, But these are two examples, Ruth, of, of where uh, we, the Scottish Parliament has made a lot of subordinate legislation, um, uh, or ministers have made a lot of subordinate legislation, which has been approved by the Parliament, uh, and uh, that uh, it, it, it is alive and well uh, as, as a concept in, in uh, Scottish lawmaking. Thank you. Um, well, we're coming up to the to the end of our time because I know um, particularly Hugh's got to dash off to, to chair another meeting. Um, 
this problem is going to run and run as, as uh, some of you alluded to it's it's going to become more acute over the, the coming months and years particularly with the the rule bill on the horizon this whole question of the democratic deficit is also then going to uh, get, going to going to get more traction um, I think the lesson from today is there's no easy solutions so there's quite a few ideas uh, in the mix um, but it's going to require political will political engagement and and that that all important word respect um, and we're going to need to see that politically um, over the, the coming years. Can I thank all four of you for, for um, joining us today? Um, it's been incredibly interesting. This will all feed into our review on delegated legislation, where we're touching on the kinds of things Michael's just been talking about, about you know, the, the actual procedures, the scrutiny procedures used in, in emergency and, and non-emergency situations. And we're looking at what scrutiny models we're going to need to, to include in our recommendations to address some of these issues in respect of um, UK legislate UK wide legislation being utilised in respect of areas of devolved competence. Um, so a big thank you to, to all of you. Um, the, re the recording of this event will be on our website uh, shortly and we'll circulate it to everybody if anybody wants to catch up or, or missed any aspect of it. And um, to get early notice of our future events, um, then you can go on our website, sign up to our newsletter, which you can get through the quickly through the Twitter handle uh, at Hansar Society. Um, and you can also sign up to our next event, which will be on the Wednesday, 12th of October, where we'll be doing a briefing event around the retained EU law bill. So we'll be touching on some of these issues again. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. I hope you found it interesting and useful. Thank you to our speakers. Um, and I hope to uh, that we'll, we'll get some of you along to our future events uh, in the coming weeks and months. Thanks very much. Bye.